right, so welcome back to Cracks in Postmodernity. We have a very special guest today, Juno Diaz, who's an author who I'm a very big fan of, so we're very excited to have you on. Oh, no, Stephen, it's great to be back with you. Thank you so much. So just a little background for me. Um, so I did my undergrad in Spanish literature at Fordham in Manhattan, and I had a class on focusing on Caribbean literature generally. And we read things from hundreds of years ago, spanning up to your novel, The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde. So that was when I first was introduced to your work. And I don't know, I mean, your style of writing really struck me as something unique, something very particular. Um, but also the, the range of topics that you covered was really fascinating. Um, the way you talked about Im the immigrant experience, Dominican identity, masculinity, spirituality, all these things. So I went on to read all of your other books several times. Um, so no, there's there's a lot to talk about. So I want to start specifically with your writing style, um, which I find to be again, it's like it's it's hilarious. I find it to be very enjoyable while also like making a kind of powerful commentary on important social phenomena. So I don't know, say a little bit about how you've developed your writing style and and what what's unique about your style from your perspective. Well, I mean, first, Stephen, thank you for having me. And um, second, it's always strange when one thinks about, well, I mean, maybe not everyone, but for me, certainly the elaboration of my writing, when I think of its sort of um, progress um, and the process that led to the progress, uh, it always seemed to be rather brute. Um, it always seemed to be a, a task of sort of, um, naive experimentation by which I just mean that I would just keep trying things. Um, and there was certainly an additive and subtractive element to it. Um, you know, some people are very lucky. They kind of experiment wildly and uh, in sort of orth orthogonal ways that allow them to kind of get these, uh, these kind of revelatory uh, advances in their voice and their kind of um, literary persona because all of these things sort of connect and in the kind of what language they can use or what language can uh, the the story or the novel sustain right uh, because depending on the material it can only sustain a certain well at least in my sort of with my abilities other people might have a greater range but depending on what i'm writing about it, it sort of sets the parameters of what language it can sustain or maintain or what kind of personas kind of approaches you know um, some materials call for less estreporous work. Um, sort of uh, other material call for this kind of uh, kind of almost Rushdian uh, capacity, you know, this kind of capaciousness. So I remember when I started out working, um, there was this supremely boiled down, no jokes, no asides, kind of linear matter of fact, almost repertorial, kind of a, a form of literary reportage, you know? Um, and I couldn't do more than that. I couldn't um, kind of, uh, I, didn't ha I wasn't up to any hijinks when I was doing that kind of work. And it was only as I gained confidence and I began to kind of filigree it, you know, um, to, to sort of embellish. And I began to kind of really get at what makes me an interesting storyteller versus what I had the talent for. I began to see that it really mattered to me that I would be able to, um, you know, mobilize my humor and mobilize certain elements of my intellect and kind of give them to my narrators and my narrative point of view. Um, you know, I, I kind of used to think when I started out, literature was um, in my mind was not nearly as, um, able to sustain humor as it is now for me. And that was a huge change. And the kind of humor that we in the Caribbean, and I mean, there's a massive Caribbean, there's an infinities of Caribbeans, but certainly the Caribbean I grew up in, there was a, a kind of a, uh, almost um, a delirium of comedy, even in the weirdest and perhaps just uh, sort of kind of strange contexts. And I wanted to get at that. So when you talk about the development of your characters, um, I don't know, they, as you say, like there's, 
they're not like this kind of bland linear kind of development it's like they kind of pop off the page they're so um it's not just that they're they're real to life but that they're so dynamic that there are so many layers to them um somebody who may say something really ridiculous really outlandish could also be a vehicle to make a really important statement about i don't know about what it means to be human about sexuality about um i don't know that, again, about immigrant experience, all these different important phenomena. Um, so I don't know, like, I'm interested to understand more about, like, what were your sources? Like, what inspired the way that you really developed the characters? To what extent was it, I don't know, other works of literature, people you know, yourself? Yeah, no, I, I, it's, it's sort of interesting to me because, um, you know, um, look, there's nothing like judgment with a capital J mm. that in some ways goes against all of my approaches to rendering what I understand to be the human. It takes a long time for people to mean. Um, often, and, and what I mean by that is that for people to actually fully express even a fraction of the range it often takes a long time and it takes a lot of context um, and a lot of different contexts and it actually requires um, an enormous amount of listening and of curiosity i think the problem that uh, growing up that i had in a culture that uh, i grew up in a very kind of a judgmental culture a culture that uh, was fantastic with its snap judgments and in some ways the nervous system of social media could have been extracted directly from the kind of Dominican immigrant um, sort of uh, low levels of education, uh, high levels of uh, reactivity, the kind of that was the world that I kind of um, grew up in, uh, a lot of kind of uh, uh, sensational bias, um, all of these things, in some ways, uh, you know, the kind of Trujillo backed, uh, Trujillo endorsed a society in which I was raised, I think it would have found itself perfectly comfortable inside of a kind of our social media age. But for me, none of it was a useful guideline for understanding how complex and fascinating people are and how long it takes to understand anyone and how you actually have to be interested and have to really listen to get past anyone's masks, you know, and I think that that's, it's not because people are wearing masks to hide some secret core, but it's just that, you know, we live in a society that makes people feel, whether it's the 1980s or 2025, that makes people feel fantastically unsafe. Who wouldn't wear a damn mask in yeah. societies like ours? And it's not simply because there, there's some secret core, but it's just that masks are a great, you know, distance and simplifying device. And, you know, I, I realized that, um, that, you know, just from my own personal experience and the authors that I love the most, um, the reason they were able to render such indelible humanity was because of th that judgment of characters was a first step and it wasn't the last step. The characters would have these ideas about people, yet everything about the fiction would undo these ideas about them. And certainly sometimes the actual character wouldn't change their opinion, but the reader would be exposed to all sorts of insights that would allow the reader to exceed their understanding of the characters on the page. Toni Morrison is an absolute classic of this. I mean, my God, Toni Morrison is, is brilliant at showing sort of even sort of her most pain in the ass characters, characters who are obdurate or just like, they're fixed in some way. She's just remarkable in giving us the kind of the detail that would allow you to think like, mm, well, I can live in my judgment of these characters, right? Uh, live in the single color of this moment, or I could widen the spectrum, get into that rainbow effect and realize that, um, you know, uh, the idea that people are simple or the idea that people are in some ways unified uh, is the kind of, the consolation of the one doing the interpretation. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, you could be a little bit 
move away from the consolatory reflex of like your X or Y or Z of just sort of boxing people and move towards the responsibility of complexity, you know? And I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that as a person. And I began to understand that this was the doorway into what I found to be uh, intriguing literature. Yeah, and I, I have to say, so this is how you lose her and drown. The style of those that those books are written in, I feel like it really lends themselves to developing these kinds of multifaceted characters because, you know, like it's not a straight up on a linear novel like Oscar Wilde. They're, it's these series of vignettes, which are at times somewhat disconnected, but ultimately there's a thread running through all of them. So I don't know, I'm just, I wonder how I don't, writing that type of book perhaps enables you to create those kinds of characters. I don't know, what would you say about those two books in particular? Yeah, no, and I think that they're books, they're books that are about many things, as books tend to be, but they're also just about recollection, memory, and the way that we assemble ourselves. How do we assemble our worlds? I mean, my God, the, the nature of immigration is that immigration is the great shattering. You know, it is the great shattering. And uh, uh, when I look at the, the kind of the discourses that people um, conscript to try to encompass immigration, um, even those people who are reassuring everyone that immigration was nothing. It was like, you know, they had wonderful immigration experience or people who are like, my God, you know, who truck in the kind of the default mode of like supreme trauma. But all of them really speak to a shattering, mm -hmm. you know. The, the way that um, our lives and our memories and ourselves get fragmented and that we end up having to do a lot of assembly work, you know? And on the one hand, I found myself thinking about the diasporic immigrant experience and how I, I was kind of literalizing this in this sort of uh, fragmentary approach and this non-millionaire approach. And this, I would argue, mnemonic approach, mm -hmm. you know, that when one has that kind of shattering, uh, you know, memory is less a, a kind of a film and more an overturned box of postcards or a photograph. And yeah. um, it, it's a strange thing to live that way. I, and I, I thought that was interesting. And also because of something that you said that, um, you know, how it is tough to make sense of anything in anyone. Mm -hmm. And it's strange how people we know live inside of us uh, out yeah. of joint of kind. They don't live inside of us as, um, you know, moving through time in a kind of a reasonable fashion. Uh, they just, they hop all over the place. Um, things that they said to us in the present interact with things that they did in the past. Um, we get things so supremely wrong. We get, we understand someone in a certain place only to discover real concrete evidence that they weren't in this place at all. Mm. And I think that we also have to make up room for our profound imperfections. Uh, we exaggerate, distort, color, um, all of the things that are our past and ourselves. I still remember a friend of mine saying to me, this kind of cracked me up, a friend of mine being like, oh my God, when I was young, I wasn't really accepted by my community, you know, the kind of the standard, I'm yeah. the outsider, I'm the victim, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then of course, we, we, oh my God, it's the absolute default, you know, a friend of mine said, you know, if the universal language is el español, el inglés mal hablado, and then we have another universal language, right, um, in this way. But anyway, this friend of mine was saying this, but then every photograph that they showed of themselves in their past, they are surrounded by this community that supposedly rejected them. Mm -hmm. That's who they're going to prom with. That's who they're in organizations with. That's who's sitting next to them in casual photographs, not even the stage photographs. And, you know, I began to query about this and I was like, wait, this is sort of a weird, there doesn't seem to be a correlation between your description of this and the sort of reality of this, at least the, the kind of photographic documentary reality. And it really kind of began to stun my friend. They kept saying, oh shit, Oh shit, look at these photographs. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. That, that maybe I'm describing my lived experience um, in a way that isn't being completely matched. And I enjoy that as a person who writes. I enjoy that. Not only the way, um, you know, the way memory works, but also the way that we can uh, use that memory work in literature to produce interesting effects. 
Yeah, no, and I I want to go now to this thing that you said in the America Magazine interview, which I mean, it's uh, it was really revelatory for me when I read it, and I, I quote it all the time. But you were asked about the way that spirituality shows up in Oscar Wilde, and how you you know you have this syncretic mix of I guess you can say you know African uh, traditional spirituality with Roman Catholicism, the saints, Alta Gracia, all these things mixing. Um, and you you call this the you know this is born of this new world cosmology. So on the other end of immigration, you have you know the forced enslavement, you know people being dragged against their will from the culture they know, from the land they know, but also being introduced in new, a new way to look at reality in, in a spiritual sense, um, and the way that people have to have to cope, have to manage, have to figure out how to survive. Um, so no, I I want you to explain like. What is this new world cosmology? How, like, how do you see it manifesting in the culture in NDR, also in the Caribbean more generally? How is it shaped your writing? Because I think I know, it's a really loaded thing here. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's very powerful and um, clearly. Um, and, you know, it's a conversation that um, for various reasons we're not having as fully as uh, we should be, but I do think a lot of people are pushing this conversation. Um, in significant ways. Um, look, if you grew up the way I did, which is to say that um, I grew up on the one hand with a sort of a generalized uh, lowercase u universal Christianity slash Catholicism that was on display and that was, you know, sort of uh, being broadcasted from the, the kind of the mainstream churches. And then you went home to your family altar and your family veneration of ancestors and of what we would say uh, local forces, um, for example, the kind of um, powers, capital P, uh, that were being expressed in Aswa were not the ones that were being expressed in the Sibao. Certainly there was uh, overlap, but you know, I, I think of uh, the way I come from a, a sort of a mixed family in that way that my father's family was from uh, the Sibao and my mother's family from Aswa, which is a Sureña, um, and the South is uh, sort of uh, kind of the the numinous uh, core, at least of the Dominican Republic, and uh, and you know I I often think that in times of shatterings, um, in times of diaspora, in times where um, a people are rended out of the whatever the description of the human fabric, and uh, are being you know forced, conscripted into um, into a kind of an, a, a non-human abyss, right? When we think of in new world enslavement, we think there's plenty of uh, metaphors and analogies and ways that uh, uh, we tend to understand it. Uh, as Sarah says, um, um, uh, God, who was this? this was, uh, described it as the uh, an infinity of agony describing mm -hmm. new world enslavement. Um, therefore, one must create you know, or one must um, turn to numinous practices, numinous philosophies, um, cosmologies that are uh, not only equal to these abysses and this infinity of agonies, but that uh, in many ways uh, are coded with their eventual uh, overcoming. Um, and I do think that uh, it's not a surprise that um, for those of us of African descent, for those of us who came through, um, you know, that nightmare of New World enslavement, uh, where the vector of the nightmare, um, you know, where we were targeted uh, both through our bodies and because of our bodies, mm -hmm. uh, it's not a surprise that the counter would be also embedded within our bodies. How often, when I was young, growing up, the possession of bodies was an important part of the belief system which I was exposed to. How forces that exceeded our rational, forces that exceeded sort of the modernistic framework would suddenly intrude into bodies, would overwhelm or overwrite embodied consciousness to communicate, yeah, to form community. Right, because it's not just a matter of communicating sort of Gnostic messages, right? When my um, aunt or someone in the extended family 
would become possessed. Se montó, right? Somewhere there was a, somewhere there was a palo, and a uh, tía of mine, people would say, se montó. She became possessed uh, by these extraordinary forces. I think that it matters that one um, created community that existed beyond just the body that the idea that there was an actual community that wasn't at a far remove but some intergalactic or celestial remove that at any moment can make its presence felt this mattered quite a bit this mattered quite a bit at yeah. how we imagine community um, if the only communities that you can imagine are made up or comprised of the living uh, it absolutely distorts in yeah. our sense of the world, in our sense of what the future is. Um, you know, one is wise when one's community is comprised not only of that which is not alive, but of that which exceeds the human. And not simply as a tutorial or as a kind of a, a guiding light, but as a, a kind of a presence, right, that can make mm -hmm. itself felt at any moment. Uh, a presence that might have contained certain amounts of sagacity, but also contained uh, an a strangeness and an otherness that could not be easily formulated away. You know, and I think that this mattered mm -hmm. quite a lot for um, surviving the infinity, right? Because if you're surviving and if you're encountering an infinity of agony, well, hmm, you know, you're going to need an otherness and a strangeness um, that would elude all of the tricks and traps and ideologies and lunacies of the enslaving power. And certainly that kind of echu force um, that I'm speaking of, the one that exceeds, one that uh, uh, estranges, but one that is immediate and sort of present um, and really kind of just turns our sense of community sideways. It really matters quite a lot. It matters quite, quite a lot. And certainly I was being exposed to this as a kid with no idea what any of this meant. Um, but it meant, you know, the, it, when I thought of neighbors, on one level, if you would ask me at school who were my neighbors, I could describe them. But when I thought of neighbors, you know, really, really thought of neighbors, I was also thinking of that voice that would speak through my aunt, that would speak through my neighbors. And how I was thinking, mm -hmm. my God, this is a part of who I am and who we are. And it traveled with us. You know, the idea that it left Santo Domingo, came to New Jersey, reminded me of what traveled with us um, from the west of Africa to the Caribbean. Can you say more about like, you know, I was going to ask, because like you give the example of someone who like, you know, they get possessed um, or praying to the, the family altar to the ancestors. What other examples um, were brought over to the U.S. When, when people immigrated? What other examples can you think of that are, you know, that embody this kind of this form of spirituality, this co cosmology? Yeah, I mean, I also think of, um, you know, the the sort of you know, um, I think, and this seems rather, it seems sort of like obvious, right? But I'm not so certain it is um, this notion of simultaneity, mm -hmm. right? How one can simultaneously be very, very contradictory things. How one could be under the eyes of the church under the eyes of the bishopric, one could be a devout mainline Catholic, mm -hmm. and then one is at home con su palero. <laughs> and how simultaneity has not just an epistemological process, but as an idea of ontology, yeah. of being, I think is not an insignificant thing. And how does that get taught? And how does that get modeled? And what does that mean? for bodies and what does that mean for selves when there is a baseline of simultaneity the contradictions are not things that are patrolled the police but in fact things that are cultivated yeah you know they're not to be tolerated they are to be sort of exalted you know and of course you know we don't just mean the the sort of the the picayune and dreary contradictions of the hypocrite yeah you know but we mean a fundamental contradiction of like do you ask my mom mother if she's catholic she's like yes and you ask my mother if she you know uh if she's down with the misterios and she blinks at you and says of course 
And the way we're taught to venerate our ancestors, I was taught to venerate our ancestors, right? The first ancestor who dies, the power in, in our new place, the power that they're given, the way that they guide us and help us. This is something I get taught and I'm like, whoa, gee whiz, I'm not finding it in the Bible and I'm certainly not finding it in the secondary <laughs> literature of Catholicism, but hey, I get it. You know, the ways that simultaneous, for example, even some simultaneous racial practices, which are so vexing to an American imperialistic, uh, to an imperial blackness, to describe that, you know, something that uh, Henry Louis Gates mentions uh, in a conversation, an imperial blackness, right? Like a, a hegemonic idea of blackness it doesn't really encompass sort of the various blacknesses that we can find in you know, all across Africa, all across uh, the new world, right? Where someone could deploy an idea of their blackness in one community and then immediately evoke another one somewhere else simultaneously. And that can be very, very vexing, you know, but certainly as a survival strategy, I'm not sure I'm gonna knock it since this survival strategy brought us to where we're at now. Yeah, mm, no, this, this kind of ontological complexity not born of like, you know, intellectual inquiry or rationalizing, but born out of a very real, visceral experience um, of suffering, but also of beauty of community. Like this is, I don't know, that's one of the things that really fascinated me, but especially, yeah, like the role of the body, this idea that the transcendent is present in our midst. And again, it's not just this like rationalistic construction that's out there, you know, somewhere. Um, the nervous system, it's a brain. The body is a brain. Yeah. The body is a brain. And I think that the idea that we only process the world and we process society and we process ideologies through just this top brain, that's, that's, that's nonsense. And yeah. the, brain has, the body has its wisdom. Yeah, no, and it speaks to, I mean, when you think of, especially if you're thinking specifically about Christianity, like you see that the way that the, you know, the way it was born was not as a system of thought like it was born from this person who's claiming to be god and then a community surround you know was born from this um from relationships with this person you know relationships continue to to grow um this network of relations i should say um but then you see like i don't know you see descartes you see the enlightenment saying okay well the body and the mind are two separate things and you see even within christianity following suit with that dualism that division when in reality, like the foundation of that belief system is that God is in the flesh, the divine enters into the human experience, the concrete and tangible. And you see that in certain cultures, that dualistic mentality never really took. So when you're talking about in DR in the Caribbean, but even if you look at certain European cultures, like in, in Italy, in Greece, where some of my family members are from, like, that's not a thing. Like, the Enlightenment never took off in Greece for a reason, because their sense of spirituality was, like, it's all mixed. And that's why you'll see, even in Greece, and, and in Italy as well, like, you'll have people, you know, going to church, going to mass, doing all the things you're supposed to do, and then they'll practice some, some folk witchcraft, they'll read coffee cups, they'll, you know, they'll cast some curses. But, I don't know, like, it's, it's interesting to see, though, that, like, within within certain realms of Christian theology, there's this attempt to go back to the body, to go back to this idea of the incarnation, because we see what dualism does, it kind of screws us over. Because it's, as you said, like our brains are part of our body. You can't just decide like Descartes to create, you know, to create this division, because it's not, not really real, you know? Yeah, no, most assertively. And, you know, and I think that um, there is a way in which, our body houses foundational memories yeah. that we have to wrestle with. We understand, I think, sort of mainline science understands that um, if our bodies are traumatized, our, our, that trauma works itself through us somatically. But I also just think that, you know, one could take that to a certain uh, a kind of a a, a kind of a deeper or more longitudinal level, right? That, um, yeah. you know, when I look at my family in Central Domingo, when I think about some of their practices, I think of the encoded survival wisdom of their blackness, of a blackness that survived all the vicissitudes of centuries. Um, this idea that, uh, you know, the, the anti-black, white supremacist politics in a place like the Dominican Republic were just this monolith. There had never been ups and downs, that there had never been these kind of deceptive cul-de-sacs that could lure people 
um, into kind of uh, falling for nonsense that could undo the work or the survival or survivance of a century. I think it's really important, you know, uh, mm -hmm. to think about the, the ways that these um, kind of soul, hyper soul computers that are our bodies, you know, um, specifically those of us who come from certain traditions. But, uh, you know, boy, oh boy, do they speak. And yeah. it is our, our kind of life path to decode. You know, oracles, yeah. okay, emissaries, all right. Visitations, I get it. And I think a lot of this stuff is externalizing um, that kind of uh, dialogue that one is having with this sort of um, hyper soul that exists certainly um, that is encoded in black bodies and bodies of African descent, but I would argue um, across the board in many sort of marginalized uh, communities, certainly in indigenous communities, it seems to me from an outsider, but I can speak to the one I know best. Um, and, uh, you know, we're always talking about visitations from, um, you know, and there's this overriding sense that there's uh, angels can come and visit us. And I'm like, mm. <laughs> I wonder how much of that is just uh, that externalization of something very, very internal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting point. And it, like, so now that you bring up the way that the politics in DR shape these kinds of, um, you know, the way certain ideas are construed, especially having to do with, with uh, racial identity, but also in terms of gender, you know, you brought up through heel, you brought up how, you know, he kind of sets an example of, um, yeah, an example of masculinity, an example of power, of success um, that does make its way into your novels, even in moments that it's not explicit, like you see it through certain struggles that the characters are going through. Um, so no, I, I, I've always found the way that you depict male characters to be really fascinating because it's, uh, like you said, like the judgment is never... I don't know. You leave a lot of room for nuance because a lot of these guys are very real. Like I know guys who are who are like these characters, and you're not necessarily trying to defend them. You're also not condemning them. You're just letting them be. Um, so I don't know. I, I want to hear a little bit more about how you how you've developed specifically the male characters, but also to what extent has the culture, the politics, and DR played a role in how you've developed them. Well, but I I think that you know we. We fall for, look, we're, even as I speak about, you know, certain kinds of uh, information, certain kinds of knowledges, certain kinds of corpuses that, for example, archives that exist um, encoded in certain bodies and certain traditions, uh, certain survivances. I mean, we're also straight up dumbasses. We fall for all sorts of shit. The reason we need these kind of robust systems, the reason we need communities is because the individual is incredibly weak um, and falls for shit. You know, glamour instantly takes all the maturity out of us in, in seconds. And if you're not careful, anyone could fall for anything. You know, so I say this by way of talking about masculinity and uh, how, you know, we, we resonate with culturally endorsed power, culturally endorsed beauty. Um, uh, we are often at odds with ourselves. And hegemony takes advantage of this and you know masculinity one of the great sort of uh lasting hegemonic constructs um takes advantage of a lot of our uh, you know our kind of slippages in ourselves the kind of vulnerabilities we have um you know i, I think at this moment um everyone's talking about recently again they're revisiting um you know that whole chris rock uh will smith thing and what I keep being stunned by, I mean, there's a lot of things to be stunned by in this whole kind of complexity. But, you know, if you want to talk about a kind of a perfect moment to talk about um, Afro diasporic or Afro descended masculinity playing itself out on a kind of sensational, literally a stage, right? I think it's just so fascinating how, like, Will Smith got to sit there throughout the entire event. Mm -hmm. Yo, my man committed an assault straight up assault but he's the kind of pretty boy the kind of dude who you know had always been quote unquote good um you know had a certain kind of stature both could make all sorts of like excuses and alibis that well you know he was standing up for the black women in a certain kind of way but kind of a remarkable thing huh. that on film my dude was able to commit an assault 
like that. Yeah. Now, if you and I have done anything like this in a public setting, and it depends, it, it, I just, I, I can't see it. I can't yeah. see it. And mm -hmm. hege hegemonic masculinity is just astonishing in its ability to kind of conscript, you know, even feminism, right? There were people who were like, well, you know, he was kind of defending Jada, and like, you know, a lot of things were going on in there. And I do think it's important when we think about masculinity that, um, you know, that the way that we tend to think of it is this sort of like, well, there's there's this toxic masculinity that we can all recognize and everyone knows it's kind of bad and, and you know, we, we know how to kind of frame it. And, that, yo, I wish it was that simple. Yeah. I wish it was that yeah. simple. And I, I guess when I think about masculinity, I think of the way that it just lives not only in a malignant form, but in forms that many of us will fall for. And the same for all hegemonies. And so when I write, I try to remember remind myself that there's um that you know not only does this stuff live in so many people but it also lives in a kind of a, a piecemeal fashion plenty of folks who are otherwise invulnerable to the uh, enticements of kind of hegemonic masculinity will find themselves falling for some aspect of it yeah no and that's one of the reasons why i find these characters so fascinating because you're not redu yeah like you're not reducing it to this simple like oh you know they're toxic and have to unlearn their toxicity and then everything will be great and we'll all get along like no like these are people with a whole variety of experiences and reasons why yeah sometimes their behavior might be toxic but also sometimes it's an attempt to gain validation or to express the fact that they want to be loved like there's i don't know like it's there are some nuances here and it's uh, a communal problem yeah and i think i think we love targeting the individual because it uh, excuses us from the communal problem mm. right that this is a sickness of an entire community and we could just all kind of cross our arms in the prosecutorial mode and say that person's toxic and that person's that because it's easier to kind of individualize it and not say hey it's all of us in it together and certainly there's certain kinds of individual expression that we should be watching out for and should be you know uh, rightfully condemning, but that overall, that should always loop back to this is a communal problem. And the, I think no. okay. the other, just the other small point that I was going to say is that to have a, a, a long memory helps because so many of us are not who we were. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. We're just not who we were. If I summon any of us at age 11, and let's say I, I could put a time travel recorder when we were age 11, recorded us for a year, and then just put all the garbage that we used to say and think, I, I, I think it would disturb any of us. And if we yeah. remember with a generous spirit how fucked up we were and thought when we were younger, it would help us to remember what is possible yeah. and how today's nonsense could lead to tomorrow's sophistication, right? If we ourselves embody transformations that would sort of stagger the imagination. Well, why is it so hard to imagine other people could have that? You know, mm -hmm. why is it so hard to imagine that that's not a viable? I just, I don't get it. You know, I have friends of mine, I had a friend of mine the other day tell me, you know, they were like, well, I was never racist. <laughs> and it was the best conversation ever because I was like, you were never racist. I was like, do you want me to call your brother right now, the older brother, and ask him that question and say, how did he feel about that? My friend went silent. Because you know, our pasts are informative. Our past should be a source of humility and remembrance. But why do you think we're so fixated on this kind of, um, I don't know, this simplistic puritanism? Like, either you're good or you're bad. There's no growth. We got to, like, why are we so desperate to prove, like, I'm not racist? I've never we're been. We're implicated because we're so profoundly implicated in all of this. And Look, you want the honest truth, it's either, sure. if we're going to talk structural, they're like, sure, bro. <laughs> Go on with your rants. I hear you. I just think, <laughs> look, we have made very, very strong arguments, very important arguments, structural arguments about how deep and impacted the sort of mass incarceration logic. So if we're we're agreeing with Michelle Alexander. We agree that this is a hyper carceral society mm -hmm. and that incarceration and all of its instruments have worked their way into every part of life. That it's not just the plantation began and ends here or the prison begins and ends here or the police begins and ends here. 
right? I, I would say that a huge part of the mass incarceration of this industrial complex, a huge part of this logic has found its way into so much of what we call society, mm-hmm. into so much of what we call the sort of the, our, our imaginaries, our habits. And I do think that there's a lot to say about the way social media functions and the way that the, that the logic of mass incarceration that has colonized so mm-hmm. many people, including progressives, um, has shaped the way that we approach people. And that, you know, it's turned us all into prosecutors. And prosecutors don't want to hear about nuance. Prosecutors don't want to hear about transformation. Prosecutors don't want to hear about uh, circumstance or about other evidence, or they don't need, they'll do, they'll bury contradictory evidence. They'll bury exculpatory evidence. Mm-hmm. Look, if, I, if, if 2000 years from now, if anyone had to say, ask me if I was revivified a brain brought out of the cold and it's like these hyper aliens are sitting around saying, what's the only thing we should know about the society is that, you know, that our hegemonic overlords have turned us all into prosecutors have given us the habits of prosecutors and social media has helped sharpen that that tendency mm. you know I, I would argue that prosecutors uh, are, are more comfortable with us now than they ever have been yeah this is a that's a hot take i haven't heard before i mean that's yeah so but if, if this is true though if that's the case then what do we do are we eternally fucked or can no, we No, none of it it's a habit <laughs> most of us resisted at our best time yeah i'm not saying this is who we are we're not who we are when we tweet look most of us in our best selves resisted what i say is that this is an, an, a tendency that we're encouraged to this has now become a cultural default yeah and i think that we when one wants to counter a cultural default, we have to first be aware of it. And, you know, we have to kind of work with it in ourselves, you know, and I, I say work with it because we have to converse with it. We have to have a dialogue with it. You know, I mean, I try to remind myself, I mean, of course I'm a teacher, so that is a big part of who we are. It's like, I remind myself is like, is today going to be a prosecution day or am I on defense? Right. Am I looking for excuses to lock people up or am I looking for my excuses to understand people? And I know what the society wants because part of this is the, the neoliberal impulse to fracture and fragment solidarities. If everybody's a prosecutor, you don't got to worry about solidarities. Yeah. You know, and this is a habit that has helped the neoliberal sort of project continue to expand and continue to tighten its grip on us because the only thing that neoliberals sort of the hegemons are terrified of is solidarities. And so they're going to push everything that's anti-solidarity. And I think that as a writer, I've been very interested in this because, you know, I I kind of really believe the the imaginaries of solidarity are the ones that have created what we call the African diaspora and are going to see us through. And I'm constantly writing about, you know, how communities survived the worst. Mm. And it's interesting to be make the connection between the way we we look at the world our our cosmologies and this experience of total atomization under neoliberalism because the more people are atomized more people are disconnected from community but also from a greater sense of meaning a cosmological purpose it's so much easier to be manipulated um oh God, yeah. anything you know oh, yeah. so and i don't know like it's interesting how so yeah, certain like certain explicitly spiritual practices can disrupt that atomization, can disrupt that kind of um, hegemonic power. But also, what you're saying that yeah, like something, something like your writing can be a way to explore the effects that this has had on you to to challenge that mentality. But uh, what other than your writing, what else for you is a means to challenge that kind of atomization? How else do you live that ideal kind of solidarity in your own life? Well, I mean, I think that you look, there's a couple of things. First of all, um, you know, our nervous systems get trained. And the one thing that we've got in our nervous systems trained is in reactivity. Yeah. You know, we're everything is a reaction. Everything is I say we, we're, we, we don't live in the slow zones. Deliberation, compassion, justice all exist in the slow zone. None of these things are possible in reactivity. If your nervous system is primed for reactivity, forget compassion why reading is great and why reading is an awesome like litmus test 
Can you drop your body out of reactivity? Can you drop your entire being out of reactivity? Because you can't be reactive when you're reading. You've got to go into the slow zone. You've got to sit there. Music, art, helping other people. You know, I always think like, you know, the question I was always asked by my mentors is whenever I would moan about my, you know, sort of oppression, they would always ask, as compared to who? Which is, they reminded me that like, no. one has privilege always, and one, no matter how fucked up things are, that one can leverage that privilege to help others. You know, and I think habits, it's like these habits that encourage deliberation, habits that encourage, that bring us into the slow zone, and habits that remind us that the great responsibility we have with our disenfranchisement and our marginalization is to use whatever the privilege we have in this context to help others. And, you know, every time that I am kind of jacked up, nothing humbles and nothing gives back life than just being like, you know what, <laughs> I might have broken both feet, but I got my hands. Uh, let me stuff envelopes for my friend's organization because I can do that. Hmm. Yeah, the tough thing, you know that nobody reads anymore. Like, do you know how many people, there are people who I've bought copies of your books for because I want them to read it. They won't read, people don't read. Dude, I'm there... a teacher, I'm a professor. Of course yeah. I know people don't read. Yeah. My students will lift their hands and say, professor, listen, I ain't reading this. Just tell me straight up. They're like, I ain't reading this. I ain't got the kind of time for this. Is it and... time or is it, I mean, I, my theory is that it's, um, that it's social media that like rewired our neurons to the point that I mean, we can Of course read. we have, of course I have. I mean, we live. Why, why else though? Why else are people not reading? I mean, I think, I think first of all, it's, it's something that Harold Innes describes, you know, the Canadian, um, theorist. And it's, it's, it's the way that, um, time is being played with. Right, time is an artifact of hege hegemony, and that we're all being asked to frantically busy ourselves, and almost always it's busy ourselves to the enrichment of our digital overlords, right? And to our minds are never at rest. Why? Because and this it's not just social media, but social media helps communicate this that these cultures of precarity and that there's not this counterbalancing spaces for us inside of these cultures of precarity mean that we're just always profoundly unsafe and when one's unsafe one's hyper vigilant it's hard to drop down you know and i mean i wouldn't say that being a dominican kid in 1979 in central new jersey was a particularly safe space i would argue i would have rather immigrated now yeah. <laughs> to the community i lived in but at least in this in those unsafe times there was spaces for one to reconstruct oneself, to reconstitute oneself. I think these days, um, strategies of reconstitution, which we need to survive, you know, these wild cultures we live in, uh, tend to be entirely in the hands of the people who mean us harm. So we can't reconstitute ourselves from a hard day, but by just thumbing through our feeds, that's not helping us reconstitute us. In fact, it's reifying a lot of the terrors yep. um, of our precarity. But how do we break free from these addictions? It's hard. You see people are doing it, you know? And I look at now how many people are, uh, especially, you know, brothers and sisters and people of color, many people of African descent are like taking up the wilderness, hiking, camping, like mm -hmm. doing stuff that pulls them away a little bit. Yeah. Um, no, because when I think about why do I read, Part of it is because I am a nerd, you know, it's, it's my, my personality, my temperament that I find, I don't want to say an escape, but like I found, I find solace in reading, whether it's fiction, whether it's nonfiction, doesn't matter. Um, I don't know for people, I just wonder why for people like it's other than the fact that there are all these, these forces that kind of distract us, like. I could never imagine living without reading books because it's like, it's an essential part of how I make sense of the world, you know? So I don't know, like, but for you, why? Like, why, why did you read? Why do you read? Bill, look, first of all, it's a muscle. Uh -huh. you know? I know plenty of my students when they tell me that like, professor, when I was in high school, I read so many books and then it, the muscle atrophies. It's a muscle. You work the muscle, you get it back, you know? Um, I think 
for me, reading has its deepest roots in both a profound curiosity. I immigrated to the United States at a time where there wasn't internet, when a time where if you wanted any information, you had to go to a book. Our Instagram, our Twitter, our Wikipedia, our fucking Reddit, everything was books. That was all compressed into books. Mm-hmm. Our YouTube, you know, and therefore for somebody like me who wasn't just sort of surviving immigration, but was curious about where I came from, where I ended up, what this was all about, what this damn world was, what was all these things I'd seen. Suddenly I was being exposed to an imperial power that had all of its content, which I'd never seen before. People from other parts of the world, other traditions, all of this stuff was, I was just kind of being exposed to. I was curious. Mm-hmm. I think there was in me a curiosity that was not smothered by all of my childhood and all the things that happened. And so there's that impulse, this thing of me that needed answers and books were the answers. Um, there was also a survival strategy. I had a wild ass fucking family. My dad was bananas authoritarian, and bananas sort of abusive. Uh, my dad was like straight up a fucking nightmare. Yet, fortunately for me, there was a contradiction in his sort of authoritarian, um, you know, masculine, just awfulness. There was this contradiction where he wasn't so fucked up that he would disrupt my schoolwork. Mm-hmm. If I was going to get an ass beating, you know, the, they would wait for the homework to get done. <laughs> and I got to tell you, that contradiction, most people don't get that. Yeah. For me, I took that as an advantage. I was like, wow, I can survive my family and live inside of these books. And, you know, I, I think of the most simple way. I had a really bad accent for years and years. Nobody could understand what the fuck I was saying. <laughs> and yet I didn't have an accent when I read. And there's something very aspirational about that for me. I still remember yeah. that, you know. I certainly felt like crap my whole time. Um, you know, in those days, people calling my family the N-word, calling them the SP word, calling them every kind of thing in the world. And to suddenly drop into a world where that wasn't happening every fucking minute of the day, where yeah. I was living through characters who were agentic, uh, who were free, that was not insignificant. You know, that gave me quite a lot when I was a kid. Yeah, and I mean, now that you're speaking about the, the immigrant experience coming over here, um, you know, I, I'm fascinated by the way that you p- depict these these Dominican communities in Jersey, in New York, obviously I have a prejudice a bias for Jersey. Um, but yeah, I don't know, tell, tell me a little bit about your experience being in those communities, putting them into your books. What's what's special about them? What I don't know. Uh, yeah, what can you say about those communities? I mean, it was wild, you know, um, when I came from the Dominican Republic from Santo Domingo, I came from a Santo Domingo that, for example, had a Japanese diasporic community, you know, yeah. I had some access to that. Um, again, I was very light skinned in uh, a neighborhood that was very, very kind of, I would always call it uh, Afro-typical, use, to misuse the term, you know, um, <laughs> you know, we were the light skinned folks. Um, and then I came into New Jersey where, uh, you know, it was a kind of a mixed Caribbean community. There was Puerto Ricans, there were Cubans. We were the first Dominicans. There was Colombians. Um, there were a lot of African Americans. You know, mm-hmm. uh, my first encounter with America was through sort of uh, Puerto Ricans and African Americans. And the Puerto Ricans had been here for a couple of generations. The kids didn't speak any Spanish, and um, and it wasn't entirely pleasant. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I you know. Um, I think we can always talk all day about the anti-blackness in all our communities, but we could also talk all day about the xenophobia in all our communities. Yeah. You know, even communities of African descent are anti-black, and you know, even immigrant communities are, you know, xenophobic. You know, super nativist, and so it was. It was bananas. You know, for one thing about growing up poor, whether it was in Santo Domingo, is that you realize that people will give you a lot of shit till they realize that. You know, all right, these people are sticking around. Oh, you go from being the newbie that people are fucking with to you become the OGs. Mm-hmm. Okay. And if I listen, one thing my childhood taught me, if I take the initial reaction anyone has for me as sacrosanct, um, <laughs> I, I would have been exterminated. Yeah. Because the same people who were like, you know, just tapping on us, just being horrors because we were immigrants, we didn't know, understand anything, we dressed weird, didn't talk the language ended up being our closest friends and 
you know, we became embedded in that community. And that process and all of its agonies and all of its sort of like difficulties, you know, I think that that was a lot of it, a lot of my way I thought about writing about community. Um, certainly the 70s sucked, yo. Woof, my God. United States just lost the Vietnam War, was on a, you know, was uh, pushing back everything to do with civil rights. Oh man, Oof. I understand it now intellectually, but I lived it with myself. Yeah. And that was kind of bananas too. Very, very bananas. Yeah. And it was good though. I, you know, it's funny because I, I, I have to tell you, growing up in a, in a kind of a African American and Puerto Rican community in central Jersey, um, taught me a lot about when people talk about building solidarities between communities you know that i learned a lot bro tell you there was no there was no majority it wasn't like my friends who grew up in the heights who grew up surrounded by dominicans or my friends some of my friends who grew up where there was a default community there was none of that we had to figure it out all along you know all the way through yeah wow no that's interesting what you're saying about like the the mixed communities versus like the predominantly you know one one ethnic group, um, the, the ways you have to navigate that kind of setting and what you have to learn about yourself, about other people. Um, but I don't know, I mean, thinking of Jersey, though, in general, as a state, we have to defend it a lot uh, against a lot of, you know, yeah, it's it's constant, all the criticism. So what what's your defense? What's special about Jersey? What do you have to say? Look, I've thought about it a lot. I'm one of the Robert Smithson people. I think that Jersey is the absolute eminent elsewhere you know, mm. we're we're look jersey exists so i always say this repeatedly jersey exists so the rest of the country never has to know what new york city thinks of it right <laughs> new york city basically has enough bandwidth to have an opinion about how whack jersey is the rest yeah. of the country it's just blink 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 has no no interest doesn't exist and yeah. in that way i think it's a special relationship if new york is the quintessential somewhere under Robert Smithson formulation, right? The place where art gets uh, valorized, where art gets sort of uh, ranked, where the museums, you know, where the, then of course there's elsewhere in his topology where art actually gets made, right? Yeah. Where uh, you're far away from the light, you're in the margins, things get weird. And I think Jersey is really just a constant elsewhere, right? Where, where nowhere that any that matters in a kind of a larger global cultural space, we're caught between Philly, we're caught between, you know, we're a transition, we're a, a transition zone between Philly and New York, yeah. between New York and DC. Uh -huh. You know, we're an airport. And I think that there's, first of all, the diversity of New Jersey, and second of all, just the deepest level, what happens when people are somewhere, where people are outside of the kind of the main work of a culture, of a society, of a power, so close to New York, but yet so far away. What are the ideas? What is possible? What's the point of view? You know, and uh, I'm sorry, I, I grew up around uh, a Panay community, a Filipina community. I grew up around uh, Koreans in the 80s when the community was really coming in. Mm -hmm. I, I got exposed to so damn much. And we're a car culture. Yeah. Really, really interesting what happens when there's no public transportation. Mm -hmm. How you got to work starting at age 12 so that you can save up enough money to have a car. Mm -hmm. what that does to your sense of agency what that does to your kind of you know your own kind of uh, relationship to work the average jersey kid works like an immigrant simply because there's no public transportation yeah <laughs> you know and then mm -hmm. just other yeah. i just think of a lot about jersey just a lot about how we're it's sort of like they turned queens into a state you know yeah. and just god just just the amount that i was exposed to just extraordinary yeah uh, the the one bone I have to pick is that one of the main major cities of Jersey that never appears, at least not that I've realized in your books, is Newark. What happened to Newark? What happened to Newark is that's where my brother received his chemotherapy for years and years and years. Uh, okay. All right. We can give you a pass then. So, and funny, I had an entire Newark chapter in um, in the Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde, which I had to was there? It was cut. Okay. Yeah, because I don't remember anything. No, well, this was my the mother. It's the mother's first years in the United States. So she and came to Newark first. And um, wow, that changes everything. Wow. 
It was a great Newark chapter, except it sucked. It was actually super slow. Nobody oh. liked it. Nothing ever happened in it. And I had to cut it. And it ended up being like 100 pages long. It was crap. Um, oh. My mother lives in Newark, runs away from a relationship. And when she runs away from a relationship, she, the chapter ends with her going to um, Patterson on the same street where the, the men who were falsely accused of, of uh, assassinating Malcolm X live. Um, oh. So there was this, okay. I thought was interesting, but it was actually terrible, terrible chapter. Can we get any, can we get a glimpse at something that happens or something that inspired at least the Newark chapter? I mean, sure. I, again, my, we would go to Beth Israel Hospital. Okay. Uh, that's where my brother would receive his chemotherapy. In those days, you have to understand this. It's not like today. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to like uh, balderize my mother's parenting, but my mother was like, if you had a pulse at the end of the day, you're doing well. This idea of like the super surveillance of your kids, the kind of the, my mother didn't think of us as her friends. My mother didn't think of us. As, I don't think as particularly valuable. You know, she loved us, but, you know, she would set us out when we left and we would come back at a certain time. And if we were alive, cool. So uh, my mother would be with my brother uh, in his chemotherapy and I would just roam Newark yeah. for four or five hours. And, you know, I would walk everywhere. I just was a curious kid. People would be like, yo, don't ever come around here again, you. I'd be like, okay. <laughs> and other kids would be like, yo, look, uh, the, the Puerto Rican kids lost. I'd be like, no, I, I'm Dominican. People would be like, boo, get out of here. You know? And um, this was I, 70s? Well, this was in the 80s. This was, this in, was uh, the 80s. This was uh, 84. Mm -hmm. So the Dominicans were not in Newark yet. No, bro. No. I, I would tell people yeah. I'm Dominican. They'd be like, I, I don't know that city of Puerto Rico. I'd be like, oh, shit. Because the Puerto Ricans started to come into the North Ward where my family was, what, like 60-ish? Yeah, so they've been there for a minute. And then the Dominicans went 90s? It was late, late 80s. Late 80s, okay. But probably, but late 80s would be the, the first, the quote-unquote, first wave. No, no, not at all. I'm telling you, not at all. Wow, because, yeah, now the North Ward is, I'm going to say predominantly Dominican. I mean, the Puerto Ricans, of course, are still there, but... I mean, everywhere you go, there's Mongo Express, there's everything, you know. I was there a few months ago. I was literally yeah. there a few months ago, uh, visiting with a friend of mine. And um, yeah, no, talk about Mongo Express for real. Yeah. Wow. So you you were roaming around like Beth Israel area. So what is that West? Is that West? Oh, no. Yeah. And I, but I mean, I roamed because I had like five hours. All right. You know, and I'm not just saying that because I want to be like, oh, I, I went everywhere. I was so brave. No, I was just dumb and thought my brother was going to die and i just mm -hmm. walk and walk and walk till my leg fell off what were some of the highlights of the city i mean for me what i enjoyed about newark was that i grew up in a community that was next to a landfill mm -hmm. and um and so it felt very very lonely and i still remember that i would again um because i would get tired and things would get weird i would just sit down somewhere and watch people playing ball I loved that yeah. because there were so many kids and compared to my town where there were a lot of kids, but it wasn't like this. It wasn't like this. It just felt like, wow, I wish I had, I didn't understand things then. You know, my mother would have fainted if I had ever told her, I wish I lived in Newark, but <laughs> certainly at the level of a kid, um, yeah. it just felt so much more alive. There were so many more people there. And so I still remember sitting there and just, I would watch, just watch people play. And then after a couple of hours, I'd be like, oh, better get back. You know, and, oh God, it, it felt like a, a great counter to my loneliness, you know? That's interesting. I, I enjoyed it very, very much. Just the voices, the people yelling at each other. Yeah. You know, I'd be like, hmm. I wasn't anonymous in, by then when I was being bused into my school and um, bused into this white school and I was in uh, gifted and talented classes. I was in the, mm -hmm. the, the elite of the, of the hegemonic elite. And, um, and there was no anonymity. You know, I just love that anonymity I had in the Newark. It sounds absurd, right? Uh, sort of the privilege of a visitor. Yeah. Who lived there is going through all sorts of shit. And here I am. I'm just like, glad to be part of the crowd. Yeah. <laughs> so wow. I did get hit in the head once by ball went out of bounds. I got smacked in the head so hard. I, I came home. I came to the hospital with my glasses like this. And my mom was like, oh, were you in a fight? And I'm like, me in a fight? <laughs> I was like, oh, I, I, the last person to get into a fight, you know. Did, it, did anyone try to help you or they just like left you there? Oh no, they laughed their ass off, y'all. People were like, yo. I was like, I was like, well, I could walk away or I could continue watching the game. So I turned it into a, a monocle. I was like, 
<laughs> I'm so corny. That's wow. So that's New York. Okay. Um, no. So then, then I'm going to ask one last question. Then just wrapping up. Um, I want to talk about music. Music. Yeah, let's talk about DR and music. What are your hot takes? What 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 can you say about music? I'm not going to have much of a hot take because I mean, shoot, my goddaughter should be here to talk your ears off about music, both in from the DR and from the Caribbean in general and from the Bronx. Mm -hmm. um, I got to tell you, the one thing is I grew up in a time before bachata was like everywhere. Okay. Yo, Dominicans didn't listen. I'm trying to tell you, the Dominican I knew just didn't play bachata like that in the 70s. Well, it didn't through heel kind of like ban it or at least certainly because it, it's like you know campesino music, right? Yeah, it's man, and hood ass music. Yeah, but like I'm telling you, I would go to Dominican parties, straight up Dominican parties in the Bronx, and people were not playing bachata. And so, so I can playing? still remember when bachata was started kicking up. I was like, oh shit, all right. But then, what, what was the default music then before bachata was a thing? No, no, people play merengue and people used to play, yo, a lot of Mexican ballads, man. People would have mm -hmm. a lot of mm -hmm. Jose Napoleon and people like that, you know. There's a lot of ballads, yo. It's strange to think about how strong the Mexican music industry was in the 70s. Yeah. Where now, of course, um, it's not the same. Of course, there are, there are singers who are clearly emblematic of that. Um, but they were a powerhouse, man. But I grew up with Fania. Okay. I grew up with Ismael, the Ismaels, Rivera and Quintana. I grew up with Willie. Um, okay. I grew up with um, yeah. with Hector. I mean, that was a big, big part of what was on the stereos. And then for my own choice, think about it. I was nine years old yeah. when the Sugar Hell Gang dropped. Wow. And from yeah. that moment, I went, from that moment, me and hip hop were ever entwined. Okay. I mean, I don't think I had music before hip hop, you know, and I picked up other music, um, you know, you know, there was a lot of pop stuff that I was listening to, uh, but it was, that was the, I'm telling you, that was the, the moment things changed for me. Who specifically moment, though? Well, I was listening to, I mean, look, Big Daddy Kane. Mm -hmm. I love Big Daddy fucking Kane. Okay, so we're going back. We're going I'm about when I was a kid, yo. I'm talking about when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I really, really love Big Daddy Kane. I mean, if we're talking now, mm -hmm. you know, I think now it's like, I think for me, I don't know if you, you're familiar with this cat, and I apologize because I always am like, you know, I never know. I'm not on videos and social media networks enough to, uh, to know how people pronounce their name, but you know that that one MC, um, Toby, is it Enrique? Enrique? Way? I'm mm, sorry. Everybody's like, oh, you're, you're corny. Yo, he's incredible. Okay. If you never listened to any of his tunes, check him out, and his videos are even better. Um, check out Heat Rock. Oof. But I mean, all of his stuff. Let me find this. Where, where is he from? N W I G W E. Oh, Fi Fi F Y E Fi Fi F Y A F Y E F Y E. Okay. Sure. Again, all my pronunciations. Get out of here. Interesting. Okay. E so check it out. What do you like? What do you like about him, though? My friend Fanone said it best. This cat is completely free. Hmm. Okay. You watch him dance. You watch him fucking spit. He's hmm. like, I aspire to be as free as him. He's just free. Right. You know, like I see him perform and I just hear, I, you just hear chains break. Whether what? they're inside or outside, I'm just like, this cat is it. You know, in a just world, nobody would be talking about Beyonce, nobody would be talking about Chris Rock and the slap. They would all be talking about Toby, man. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to have to add that to the playlist. Okay. So before we go, Juno, anything else, anything you want to plug? I mean, you know, I just, I don't know if it's doing this I want to plug. I think that, um, you know, I think it's, it's really, you know, it's been, it's been really important to, um, to keep just keeping in the culture, um, keep reading. I, you know, one of the things that uh, really has gotten me just it's super excited. Um, I don't know if you know the, the, the conflict photographer, um, Moises Saman. 
Yeah. Oh my God, he's like a Magnum cat. Uh, uh, S A M A N. Um, um, what says like his photographs are just awe inspiring. He's a yeah. Spanish Peruvian and um, just just awe inspiring. Like, yeah, there's the world. He's just remarkable. And I, I, I would say that that's, if anything, it's been like kind of just inspiring me and keeping my eyes open and just filling me. I think that right now I've just been just wild on his photographs, man. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it just to sum everything up, it's, it, I have to say like it, hearing the way that you're making sense of everything going on in the world, everything that's gone on in your own life. Like it's, um, it's clear that there's, there is hope as much as things get fucked up, as much as things are confusing, painful, that when, especially when we look to, to art, to relationships, to spirituality, all these things, like when we give ourselves the space, the time, you know, to, to really process things slowly, as you said, like, yeah, there, there is a way forward, you know, maybe we're not as screwed as we think we are. So. I don't think so. I mean, you can't hope, you can't teach without that. You know, if you're a teacher who doesn't have hope, you, you should quit because, and, and, and again, it always comes back. I think about my grandfather in Oslo, you know, my grandfather who grew up cutting sugar cane. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I love the, uh, I love that abuelo to death. And this cat could never have imagined me, but, you know, he was a hopeful dude, man. He had one one thousandth of what I had, even when I was poor as shit growing up and hopeful, hopeful dude, man. And I think of somebody of African descent who grew up on a sugarcane plantation, who grew up cutting sugarcane, who was named after the German foreman wow. on one of the plantations. And that cat had hope. But the, oh, my poor abuelo could barely read. You know what I mean? This dude, super humble. Everybody took advantage of him. He never had money that people didn't steal. All the luck in the world just skipped him. I just, I think of him, man. I think of all that whole generation. I'm like, if that cat who had so little, could stick it out so mm. some people like us could come around we can stick it out we got this man yeah no we gotta remember that but now with that being said juno thank you for coming on steven thank you man good luck down there jersey bro thank you <laughs>